Cosmic radiation is a big problem on Mars. Its very thin atmosphere and complete lack of a magnetosphere mean that the surface is exposed to the full power of the sterilizing rays from the sun and other cosmic sources. There are proposals for making Mars bases underground in caves and lava tubes where the several meters of rock above them protects them from the majority of the cosmic rays. And that's not a bad idea, but who wants to go to the red planet just to live as a race of mole people? What if we could build thick, concrete, radiation-proof walls on the surface of Mars made out of 95% Martian soil? Well, today we're going to try turning my Martian regolith simulant from a previous video into a concrete-like material called Starcrete. And then we're going to test its physical properties against regular concrete and I'm especially interested to see how well it can block cosmic radiation. I'm also going to follow the same steps with my lunar regolith that I also made in a previous video. So we can make some lunar star crete or like moon crete and see how that stands up against the Mars crete and the regular concrete. The only problem is, thanks to our atmosphere, I don't really have any access to a decent quantity of cosmic rays. For reference, cosmic rays are a generic term for a load of random stuff that gets spat out of stars and supernova. About 80-90% of it is high energy protons, but without a particle accelerator I don't really have a way of creating any high energy protons of my own. And these protons aren't super penetrating anyway, so we don't have to worry too much about them. Any decent amount of shielding will stop most of them. But a small component of cosmic radiation is gamma rays. And these are very penetrating, so they can be quite dangerous. So my idea to simulate these cosmic gamma rays is to build my own X-ray generator. Now this is nowhere near a perfect simulation because even though X-rays and gamma rays are very close together and even somewhat overlap on the electromagnetic spectrum, the X-rays that I'll be able to generate are gonna be several orders of magnitude smaller than most of the cosmic ray gamma rays. So we're not really gonna get any hard data on how these pieces of starcrete are gonna fare against cosmic rays, but at least we'll be able to see how well they can block X-rays compared to regular concrete and some other common shielding materials like lead. We'll get into how I built the X-ray generator later in the video, but for now I just wanna mention some of the safety precautions I took. The X-ray tube I'm gonna use is a rectifier from an old CRT TV and it emits a fraction of the amount of x-rays that a commercial machine would emit and the voltages that I'm going to run it at directly limit the penetrating ability of the x-rays. On top of that, I put lead shielding all around the tube, I stood 10 feet away from the machine while I was operating it and I only ran it for a few seconds at a time. But before we get into that, we have to make the starcrete. So starcrete was proposed in this paper as a future building material for Mars bases its main advantage is that it requires very little material to be brought from Earth. Most of it's just Martian soil. And on top of that, they report some impressive structural characteristics that match or even exceed, in some cases, that of regular concrete. And the secret ingredient that you need to turn this dusty Martian regolith into strong concrete is potato starch. Maybe the researchers had the idea watching Matt Damon growing potatoes in the Martian. So to summarize my Martian regolith video, in case you haven't seen that, no Martian soil has ever been returned to Earth yet, so how do we even know what's in it? Well, the Mars rovers that have been up there are basically labs on wheels, and they've been doing all kinds of analysis on it over the years, so we've actually got a really good idea of what the chemical composition is. And I used that data from the Curiosity rover to create my own regolith, and that's what we're gonna to use today. It's also worth mentioning that to achieve these impressive structural characteristics, they did have to use a hydraulic press to compress the starcrete with several tons of force, which makes the whole process slightly more technologically challenging, but I guess it wouldn't be the hardest thing in the world for NASA to invent some kind of solar powered, lightweight hydraulic press that they can take to Mars. I'm gonna go for a slightly more accessible method of compression called a hammer, and uh, we'll see how our results compare. Of course, you can buy potato starch pretty cheaply, but I thought we might as well do it properly Martian style and extract it myself. So I peeled some potatoes, grated them, soaked them in water for 10 minutes, and then I strained off the liquid. 
I then I waited 20 minutes for the starch to settle out to the bottom because even though we managed to extract it with this water, starch isn't really soluble in water, it just allowed itself to be carried away. And I started decanting off all of the brown water. Then when most of the water was gone, I washed the starch with some clean water. Decanted all that off. And then dried the starch on a paper towel. In total, I collected 90 grams of still slightly wet starch, which is gonna be way more than we need for our use case. Now for the Starcrete recipe, we'll start with a four to 16 to 80 ratio of starch, water, and regolith. So for this batch, I mixed 300 grams of regolith, 15 grams of starch, and 60 grams of water. So what's actually happening in this process is that the starch acts as a binder. Starch is these long chain molecules and when we add water, it expands into a sort of gel. Think of like wallpaper paste, if you've ever had any experience with that. That's also starch based. So it forms this paste when wet, but then when it dries out, it's quite a strong binder. So this gelatinized starch coats all of the individual grains of Martian regolith. And then we kind of bake this mixture at 120 degrees Celsius in an oven for 90 minutes to remove the water. And this causes the expanded starch chains to compress back down around the regolith and around each other, forming quite a strong bind. And as you can see, this baked compound is already pretty hard before we've even done any compression. But to get the best performance out of our starcrete, we need to do the next step, which is to repowderize this dehydrated starch regolith matrix and then partially rehydrate it by adding just 4% water, which is 13 grams for this batch that I've done. But we want it to be applied evenly, so I used a little spray bottle to try and cover all of it. And what we're trying to do is add enough water that the starch on the surface of these new granules gets re-gelatinized but not add so much water that the granules start to actually dissolve and break back down. To reform our starcrete into bricks, we need a mold. So I got this small square section of steel with a solid insert that fits tightly into it. I also made a clay base cap to stop the starcrete mix from falling out the bottom. I baked the clay caps in the oven to harden and I experimented with making some Lego style stud designs on the caps, but that didn't end up working. The studs were too small and they kept falling off. Thinking about it, I should have just done a long slot along the top of the bricks. I also marked a line on the metal die so I could make equal sized bricks each time. And then I loaded up the die with some of the partially rehydrated starcrete. And then I compressed it manually by striking it with a hammer several times. I carefully extracted the starcrete bricks, placed them on a tray, and rebaked them for 60 minutes at 90 degrees Celsius to fully dry. I also made some regular concrete cubes in the same mold out of some cement and sharp sand, but obviously I didn't compress those. So now we have our samples of Marscrete, Mooncrete, and Concrete, so let's put them through a series of tests to evaluate their properties. So the first test is strength under compression. So I placed a wooden board on top of the one inch brick of concrete and started adding weights. First a 10 kilogram weight and then extra 2.5 kilogram weights each time up to a total of 25 kilograms, which it survived. So the pressure pressing down on that one inch cube is 18 megapascals or about 2,600 PSI, which I found quite impressive. But I guess concrete is made for compressive strength, isn't it? So shouldn't be too surprised. So let's see how our starcretes compare. So the Marscrete also survived up to the 25 kilograms. But the Mooncrete gave out at the 22.5 kilogram mark because 
the weights were slightly off balance and I was trying to rearrange it. It probably would have survived without that reshuffling, but take it as you will. Next I did a drop test at 50 centimeter increments and I had reasonably high hopes for all three of the blocks, but surprisingly the Mars Creep broke at the first hurdle, 50 centimeters, and the Concrete and Mooncrete both broke at just one meter. But again, perhaps I shouldn't be too surprised because Concrete's not known for its tensile strength, especially without any rebar or plasticizers or anything. Next up, I did a quick scratch test to assess the surface hardness. Um, they all had a pretty much equal hardness, being pretty easily scratched with a blade. Next, I tested the water resistance and the results were quite interesting. I poured some water on each block and then pressed them. The concrete held up fine. But the mooncrete and milescrete instantly crumbled like a sandcastle. I was expecting them to perform worse than the concrete, but I wasn't really expecting them to just completely collapse after a couple of seconds of having contact with water. But it does make sense. I mean, we know that the starcrete is sensitive to water. That's why we had to spend so long baking every trace of water out of it. The starch binding is an easily reversible reaction, whereas in regular concrete, it actually undergoes a chemical reaction to become a hardened water resistant form. So this response to water is not ideal, but potentially not disqualifying for building on Mars because the surface of Mars doesn't actually have any liquid water because the atmosphere is so small that the vacuum doesn't really allow liquid water to exist on the surface. Of course, that would be different inside a human habitat, but these starcrete blocks could be placed on the outside of a Mars base to provide shielding while not actually taking up any space inside the airtight habitat. So finally, we get to the test that we've all been waiting for, the cosmic ray x-ray test. So my first idea for measuring the level of radiation protection was to use a PIN photodiode in reverse bias, because I didn't want to risk damaging my expensive Geiger counter by sticking it in the path of a concentrated beam of x-rays, even though with the amount this tube puts out, it would probably have been fine. The basic idea with the PIN diode is that Normally it just detects sort of visible UV range of light, but if you reverse bias it, which means just reversing the power basically, you increase the size of the intrinsic region, the I in the PIN, and this larger gap is supposed to allow it to detect higher energy particles. And I did manage to get a proof of concept. So you can see that when it's in the light, it's showing this voltage and if we put it in shadow, the voltage drops. But if I hold this piece of radioactive fiesta wear next to the diode, we can see that the voltage actually increases slightly. This is due to it detecting the alpha particles that are hitting the detector. But the whole setup was quite finicky, and I abandoned it when I saw that you can actually buy a decent, cheap Geiger counter kit on eBay with an Arduino Nano already attached. So onto the X-ray generator itself. I'm gonna use this TV rectifier tube that I got from United Nuclear. They've collected a ton of them and they've tested them all individually to see which ones have this fault of being able to produce X-rays when they're overpowered. Apparently that's why they used to say sitting close to the TV is bad for your eyes because some of them were actually producing small amounts of X-rays. Another interesting thing with these tubes is that United Nuclear tell you the orientation to connect your tube in specifically your tube. It seems that it can vary which way you want to connect the positive and negative to, depending on your tube, which I don't really understand. It must be just down to some random difference in manufacturing for which way to connect it to produce the highest amount of x-rays. Uh, I would have thought the polarity would be pretty fixed because of the setup. You want the electrons to go from the cathode into the anode cup and then emit the x-rays out of that. It doesn't really work the other way around, but we also need a high voltage power supply, which I put together using this 30 volt DC benchtop power supply and connecting it to a ZVS driver, creating a high frequency pulsed DC current and using that to power a flyback transformer. It emits a rectified DC voltage about a thousand times higher than the input voltage. So we'll start out with 15 volts on the benchtop power supply, which will give us 15 kilovolts of the output which is the minimum energy required to start generating x-rays. 
I checked that it was working by testing the arc length. The estimates that it takes about one kilovolt to arc one millimeter in air. And I'd say we're getting about a 15 mil arc here. So looks like it's working as expected. And if we turn it up to 30 kilovolts, we can get a much more impressive electro boom looking arc. I built a lead lined box for the x-ray tube with an extra thick layer of lead at the back in the direction I'll be standing. And I added some extra pieces in the corners to cover the little gaps. And I cut a hole to direct the x-ray beam out of. I also added a foot pedal on a 10 foot lead to act as a dead man switch so I can turn it off as soon as I let go and operate it from a distance. So I set up the Geiger counter in front, went to turn it on and you can hear from that sound that we've successfully produced some x-rays. I moved the Geiger counter around the back to see if the shielding was working and it seems okay. When I use it for testing the Starcrete I'll be operating it around the full 30 kilovolts because x-ray production is not a simple linear thing. Pyrotechnical did a good explanation of x-ray generation in his x-ray machine build video, so I'll put a link to that if you want any more details. Essentially though, the voltage that we're supplying is the maximum energy that the x-rays can end up with, but in reality it will be a distribution with the average around half the total. So at 30 kilovolts, we'll get some x-rays with 30 kilo electron volts, but the majority of them are going to be around 15 kilovolts. For reference, commercial x-ray machines often go above 100 kilovolt, but in this setup I'm limited by the benchtop's power supply, it can only go up to 30 volts. I know I could build a voltage multiplier quite easily, and I might do that for a future video, but for now this will do. So now we have the x-ray generator working, we can assess the radiation blocking ability of the Starcrete. Also the flyback transformer started smoking, so I submerged it in oil, if you're wondering what's going on there. I placed a thick lead sheet with a slit cut into it between the x-ray generator and the Geiger counter and I got a control reading of 0.21 microsieverts per hour. So the results for the blocks were 0.19 microsieverts per hour for the lunar regolith and the regular concrete and 0.21 microsieverts for the Marscrete. So it looks like the lunar and regular concrete, even just one inch of it, did have some effect but the Marscrete for some reason wasn't quite as effective, but we can maybe get a slightly better reading by doubling up the blocks. This time round the mooncrete and concrete went to 0.16 microsieverts per hour and the marscrete actually did decrease and got to 0.19 microsieverts per hour. Uh, I'm not sure why the marscrete it seems to be less effective than the other two. I think the mooncrete has a decent amount of titanium oxide in it which is used in sun cream to block UV light so it might have some effect on blocking x-rays. Um, the regular concrete has quite a high density of actual large pieces of sand, which I assume is more effective than the very fine particulate matter that we've got in the Marscrete. Either way, as expected, it's probably gonna take a couple of meters of Marscrete to actually block most of the radiation, which is a lot, but it might still end up being the more favorable option over bringing literal tons of lead from Earth the amount of fuel and space that that would take up. But then maybe cargo runs to Mars will become much cheaper and we'll be able to send a lot of extra stuff up there relatively easily, who knows? Don't forget to check out the other videos in my Mars series. In one of them I actually managed to grow some plants in Martian soil. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, let me know if you have any other ideas for my Mars regoliths. Thanks for watching, bye.